Okay, so um, welcome to tonight's uh, SOA Central Taiwan Studies uh, lecture. T tonight is our, our latest lecture in our Contemporary Taiwan Indigenous Studies uh, lecture series. It's sponsored by uh, the Shuri uh, uh, Museum in, uh, in Taipei. What we're trying to do in, these, um, in this lecture series is to run a series of events that uh, look at contemporary issues. Uh, that face Taiwan's uh, indigenous people. In the past, we've run um, um, uh, projects that are a little bit more historical, but in, in, this, um, in this project, we want to really focus on what's happening uh, in today's uh, Taiwan facing indigenous people. So, when we first uh, drew up the list of uh, potential speakers uh, for this project, um, the first person on the list was Professor Scott Simon from, uh, from Ottawa. Um, uh, he's one of the leading figures uh, uh, that are uh, working on, on a range of issues related to Taiwan's um, uh, indigenous people. And he's someone who uh, we know well because uh, he features quite heavily in uh, a number of our uh, Taiwan studies courses uh, at, at SOAS, both uh, in terms of politics but also our culture and society uh, course. Uh, and another reason why he's such a familiar figure um, is that he's quite a, a frequent visitor to, to SOAS. Um, um, uh, I think this is something like his fifth uh, talk at, at, uh, at SOAS. So um, in the past, for example, he's spoken about um, <coughs> Taiwanese social movements uh, in, in, in 2014. And he's spoken also broadly about English, English language publications on um, uh, contemporary indigenous studies. <coughs> Um, and many of, uh, one of the great things about um, uh, Scott Simon, well, there's many great things about, about Scott, but one of them is how productive he is. I just discovered yesterday uh, he has a very interesting habit of um, having a, day, a daily target of, of what he's going to be, um, um, uh, what project he's going to write on. I think it's something that I need to kind of uh, learn from, from you. Um, his work is also very, very uh, diverse. He's not someone that you can easily kind of pitch him. Our whole. Um, another thing I admire about Scott is his, um, his language ability. Um, uh, so, for example, when he's had sabbaticals in uh, other um, uh, locations, he's really embraced those locations. So, for example, uh, he's, um, uh, he's been based in Heidelberg, he's been based in Lyon, so, so uh, he's published uh, a book in, in French, which was your last um, uh, book. Um, what we've, what we've done with our, um, our speakers on this project is to ask them to do two talks. Um, last night we had um, uh, a really fascinating talk about the relationship between uh, humans and uh, animals, particularly birds in Taiwanese and indigenous uh, communities. Um, uh, I think anyone that made that talk um, would, would say that they were uh, really amazed by the talk. Uh, it sounded like a very narrow topic, but it really kind of wowed uh, us. Um, uh, tonight's talk is a little bit different, um, 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 because tonight's talk is what we call the chapter talk. In other words, um, um, it's the talk that's hopefully leading to a chapter in our um, uh, a handbook on contemporary indigenous uh, studies. Um, to a certain extent, last night, uh, Scott hinted uh, at this topic when he, uh, when he was touching up on the issue of religious issues in indigenous communities and religious uh, divides. Um, and, and that's the topic that he's going to focus on uh, tonight. Um, so let's give Scott a very big uh, welcome home to London and so on. Thank you very much for your <coughs> kind introduction. Thank you for putting this together. I'm um, pleased of the, the to be able to contribute to this book project and to start thinking about it now. And I'm starting admittedly by thinking about it from the chapter in my own book, so it's going to go in a different direction in the chapter in the textbook because it'll be less theoretical, it'll be less of that, and more descriptive of the history of the, of the different churches and so forth in Taiwan. Um, but what I'll, I'll do is I'll be talking about making God's country a phenomenological approach to religious conversion among the Sedic and Turgo of Taiwan. 
And that's because uh, Christianity is such a big part of indigenous life in Taiwan. And so I think that as anthropologists working there, it's part of our responsibility to, uh, to, uh, responsibility to understand what that's all about. And so I start here with this uh, photograph, just the background slide. Look at the, the rainbow in there. And for the Durgo and Seche people, the rainbow bridge is a very important symbol. It's the bridge that they say takes their ancestors to heaven. They say if they, um, the, the old way of talking about it was that if uh, a man had been a hunter, or if a woman had been a good person at weaving, if they'd been working hard all of their life, when they crossed the rainbow bridge, they were asked by a giant crowd to wash their hands. And if they'd been working hard all of their life, then their hands would bleed because they'd be full of blisters. And if they didn't believe, then that meant that they were lazy all of their life. And so if they worked hard for all their life, they'd get to enter the land of the ancestors. And if they had been lazy all their life, the crowd would push them into, off the rainbow bridge, into the waters below where they would be uh, eaten by giant crabs. So it's an interesting story that they sometimes tell. Um, this picture was taken on our way from Alishan to Skadam when we crossed the mountains there. We, it was a, an interesting sight that we saw. It's not all in the photo, but there were actually three rainbows at the same time. And people were coming out and taking pictures of them because they said they hadn't seen that for decades. And, and some of the Durugu people said it's a good sign from their ancestors that our mission a group of um, indigenous people from the Mi'kmaq nation of Nova Scotia and indigenous from Australia and Maori from New Zealand and Zo people from uh, Alishan and we were on our way to meet with the Dru. So their ancestors were apparently waiting for us. So <laughs> what I'll do is I'll start by saying that this is a really old topic in anthropology in some way. Anthropologists have long tried to understand what is religion all about. And so there are many different theories, and I think that we can't go through all of them either in a chapter or even in the book that I'm writing or here tonight. I'm just going to just to skim over some of the, the main ways that anthropologists have looked at religion. Uh, some of them use a psychological approach, and uh, Freud, for example, saw this as a kind of neurosis. And so I'm kind of looking at personal issues of faith, and what kind of person would be religious. There were some others, uh, such as uh, William James and Mircea Eliana, who tried to understand religion as a way of approaching the divine. Um, William James has come up with a few ethnographies recently. Um, so that was one way of looking at religion. Uh, Durkheim, of course, uh, he looked for the collective soul of society. So he looked at rituals as a way in which societies constitute themselves. He's been very influential in anthropology. So kind of looking at ritual as a way of understanding um, the way of social integration and understanding how people come of age in society. and. Uh, Looking, kind of looking for the soul of the society. I think it's part of a uh, culturalist perspective quite often. Then Karl Marx, of course, and Marxists have looked at religion as a form of social or political domination. Um, and I think it's kind of worth looking at his classical quote here, where he said that religion is the opium of the people. Um, it's a much longer quote, and I didn't have time and space to put it all there. But he said, man is no abstract being squatting outside the world. Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, and the soul of soulless conditions. It is the opium of the people. Um, back when Marx said that opium was basically the main painkiller that people had, so it's kind of in a way like aspirin of that people. That maybe some people do need um, painkillers to get on with life and to be able to work productively. But I think that the phrase here at the beginning is very much of a phenomenological um, perspective of things. So I'm saying that man is no abstract being squatting outside the world. So there's the question of really 
being in the world and being social, which I think is important to that. Getting to some more recent approaches, um, there have been some cognitive approaches and evolutionary approaches, such as uh, Scott Atran and Pascal Boyer have looked at religion as a product of the biological evolution of the human brain. And so that's uh, looking at the way that the architecture of the brain works and how that leads people to perceive supernatural beings as part of a predator detection mechanism of the brain and so forth. Um, so that's been one of the new approaches in more recent years. Uh, Victor Turner, of course, was interested in liminality and communitas. He was looking at special rituals and pilgrimages and looking the feeling that people have while they're participating in these things, especially the uh, rite de passage, because it was based on the Tenpino's work. Maurice Bloch, who's uh, from London, he's London School of Economics, has a very evocative argument of religion as rebounding violence. I like bold in that here, because I think that's one that I want to bring up a little bit more. I think it's relevant to understanding some of the continuities that we see in religious practices in Taiwan to have indigenous communities from the old days of headhunting into Christianity. And that being said, Christianity has been very embarrassing for uh, anthropologists in some ways. They really don't, haven't known how to deal with it. I think part of it is there's a feeling of perhaps collective guilt from Westerners about all of the missionary efforts and the ties to colonialism and so forth. But even Taiwanese anthropologists, like Huang Yingui, for example, have really struggled of where to put that in. I remember I went to a lecture he gave at Academia Sinica about 20 years ago now. But I remember being amazed at listening to this lecture where he talked about Bunun religious rituals and his methodology was to talk to elderly people and ask them about rituals they had observed 60 years in the past, as if they could remember that in an accurate enough way. But he said nothing about the churches that I knew were very important in those villages. So ignoring the contemporary religious context and kind of looking for the collective soul of each particular tribe in a very Durkheimian fashion. It's only in the past uh, 10 years or so that anthropologists in Oceania, such as Joe Robbins and John Barker, have really been looking seriously at Christianity. And so now in anthropology of Oceania, there's a whole literature emerging about different Christianities and about how people have converted and become Christian on their own terms. And so I think that's uh, an important body of literature to be thinking about. So anyway, I'll get to Maurice Bloch and resounding violence. I've got here an image of one of the most frequent rituals that we see in Turubu and Sedek villages. And those are the pig killings. And usually they'll explain it to people in, uh, in Chinese as Satsu. And so they'll say that for everything almost, there's always a reason to kill a pig. So if there's a marriage, then they might kill a larger number of pigs, maybe half a dozen, maybe a dozen, maybe a wealthier family, more than that. Um, if there's a divorce, they'll kill one pig. Uh, if somebody gets a raise on their job, or they buy a car, there's some reason to celebrate, then they'll sacrifice a pig. And so the Durubu people will say that, no, it doesn't matter if the humans are happy or sad, a pig has to get killed, and so the, the pigs, are a little bit like, kind of, kind of, so, <laughs> so. So, basically I think that Maurice Bloch gives this idea of resounding violence as a way of understanding what's going on with these pig humans, which the Duru in their own language called Boda Gaya. Um, Gaya, G-A-Y-A, means the sacred law or the ancestral law. And Boda means going through, so it's going through the sacred law. It's kind of a a rite of passage. So they're announcing a transition in their life, whether it's a marriage or a divorce or a new car.
requires something. Telling the ancestors that something important has happened. They used to sacrifice pigs whenever somebody became a new member of any community or an Allah. And so it's always been an important part of their life. Now Maurice Block, in his uh, book on resounding violence, said that human societies represent human life as a cycle of birth, growth, reproduction, aging, and death. And this is for him a, a universal that all human societies have. But, in spite of the fact that everybody is born and has a relatively short life and then dies, societies have to create some kind of political and social form that is perceived as being permanent. And so religion is a way in which they can do so. And so they make a move towards what Bloch called, called the transcendental. They have to look for something that transcends the immediate life of the individuals that are present. And he said this is usually done with a conquered vitality obtained from outside beings. Usually animals, as he's talking about sacrifices in all of these cultures, but sometimes plants, other peoples, or women. And so, as we're looking at many different kinds of rituals, there's this theme of, a, of violence. So he talks about sacrifices and how it's related to hunting in different societies. But I think that you know, the killing the pig would be a, an example of some kind of concrete vitality, that there's this energy that's obtained from the pigs and it contributes, there's a sacrifice being made to the ancestors. And in return, they're said, they, they say that in return, the ancestors gave them success in their hunts. They're good at catching wild boars and other game animals. But it's a, it goes on throughout the life. It's a, something you often hear in the morning in the villages. You're awakened at dawn because the pigs are really resisting being killed and squealing. And, and then you go, everybody goes out to see what's happening, who's getting married. And, uh, if it's divorce, it's usually much more low key. Not just share the meat with the immediate friends. If it's a marriage, everybody in their alam will have to get an equal part of the meat. And uh, they take uh, special care to cut up every part of the meat, uh, the legs and the heart and everything, and make sure everybody gets uh, a fair share of everything. So I, I think that this theory that he has a resounding violence, rebounding violence, I'm going to stay there. <laughs> Um, is that it's something that we can use as we're looking at many different rituals in your life. There's uh, head hunting, uh, there are the pig sacrifices, and I even think that this the blood ritual is something that appeals to us are thinking about the sacrifice that Christ made for people on the cross. And I've actually talked to people in the village about that. Did you see any link between this head hunting as a sacrifice and and Christ is a sacrifice, and people used to, oh yeah, that's, that's what we do. <laughs> and they are quite, I maybe mean, that's because we're talking about religion while drinking beer in the evenings, but people used to be really like that. And so, but I think that this theory of rebounding violence, um, like all of these other theories that we've seen so far, <coughs> say very little about the ordinary people in their daily life. So it's not really about the life of a church and the congregation of it and the, the services on Sunday morning or Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon and then the different groups that they have going on. Basically, almost every day there are people going to the church for the different youth groups, the women's groups, the men's groups, the prayer groups and so forth. They're very active church goers. And this idea of rebounding violence doesn't really address that kind. It's all very special types of so, instead of using any of those theories that I just mentioned, which are much more common in anthropology, I started to think through it from a perspective of phenomenology. Now, what do I mean by phenomenological? I'm not really going into Heidegger's philosophy or anything like that, but I'm thinking more in terms of the Tim Ingoldian type of phenomenology that's coming in anthropology, uh, Scottish anthropologist Tim Ingold. Um, and so I'm thinking in terms of religion, in terms of some of the themes that he talks about, such as dwelling and movement. 
And so it's a question of finding, of, of creating a place for dwelling in the universe. Um, there's also the, the question of movement. So these are issues that he brings up in his books. And he doesn't really apply it as much to religion. I think that's something that I'm adding to this discussion. The idea is to look at religion from what it feels like to the participant. So what are these people experiencing as they're going to church? And they do quite often. It's not really looking at belief. I think that a lot of people haven't really thought too much about what they believe. It's not about doctrines. Um, certainly most people who are in church are not clear about all the doctrines. They're not going to theological seminary after all. And it's not about colonial power relations, which is often what approaches an anthropology have done. Um, I think the colonial power relations are especially difficult in Taiwan where the missionaries were not foreigners. Um, a phenomenological experience also includes the embodied experience of the ethnographer. Um, so there's the question of the anthropologists in the field and their relationship with Christianity. And that's something that I think for Western anthropologists is especially important. They will immediately identify us with Christianity because of our physical appearance. And so that's something that's uh, important to acknowledge and to think through. So in a way that falls into the new ethnography of vernacular Christianity and the anthropology of Christianity. And the plural is important because there are different variants of Christianity. There's not one monolithic Christianity. So I think that the big question here is uh, not how did Christianity make its way to Taiwan, but how did indigenous people find a home in Jesus instead? making a home. I think that maybe like these swallows, this is a bird relationship here, they uh, made a home in the affordances of dwellings made by others. And this was a photograph I took in the, up in Nantong in the village of Boano. And uh, it's in a little, uh, one of the little grocery stores there that people like to hang out and, and drink. And the owner of the grocery store encouraged me to take pictures of these swallows and that they come back every year and he's very pleased to have them in his home. And I think it's kind of a good, a good metaphor for us that there's a structure that's already been built and then another creature comes and makes a home and somehow indigenous people have found a home in Christianity. Although it does sometimes seem strange to me to listen to them talking about what happened in Israel thousand years ago, I'm thinking that it's about their life today. So, a very big mystery, I think. And I think that there's another issue that's important, it's part of this going perspective. And that's, they're always talking about the Alam, because the Alam is often translated as, into Chinese as Bulo. So it would be translated sometimes into English as tribe, which I think is not a good translation. Or maybe it's community, but I as I was thinking about it, writing this book, I think actually it would be better to translate it in German because it does fit better with the idea of Heimat. So the idea of a home, but also the community, a group of people who might not be related by blood, um, but there's a sense of belonging and a sense of land is a big word there. So there's a land and territory. So that's kind of the, the background to the home. But this is actually the picture I decided to put on the website as well. And I went through all my photos and really chose this one carefully. I wanted to think about landscape and space and place and how that's changed over time. So what what really strikes you from this photo? Look at the uh, tower. Yeah, the tower with the cross, and that's the true Jesus church. And so people have seen that online. And they'd be really happy to say, yeah, it's our church. Because I mean, most of my, I share it on Facebook, and my Facebook friends are mostly my indigenous friends, and they do immediately. So we've got the, the big church, which is really the defining architecture of this particular village. Most villages have really big churches in them. But I think that the mountain behind it is also very important. And so I chose this one because 
we can see that the mountain behind that has been pretty much denuded of forest. And so we've seen actually quite a bit of ecological destruction. Um, the mountains are used for growing tea and cabbage. And these are often indigenous entrepreneurs too. Uh, of course, the Taroko National Park has protected their forests, but in places outside of the park, this is much more what the landscape looks like. Um, and I kind of imagine it all being forest, but it's not. Um, and in fact, the, all over Taiwan, the indigenous people were much higher in the mountains before the Japanese came, but then especially after the Russians, when they were moved downhill. And so I think part of the story is that Christianity happened after they lost the forests. So I think that's a very important thing that's happened over a colonial period. We also see all the, the police stations in there and the electrical wires. And it's a very, it's since the Japanese period, they basically settled in these villages. They were before nomadic peoples moving through the forest. There have been big changes in their life and the way that they can use space and the way that they can create places for themselves. It's all changed fundamentally since the colonial period, so since the 1930s. So, that brings us to contemporary Taiwan. And I think that almost everybody thinks about the Presbyterian Church first. It is a very important church in the social movement. Is that in many ways, we can say that it's the Presbyterian Church of Taiwan that has created the indigenous social movement. The uh, Alliance of Taiwanese Aborigines was founded by Presbyterian networks. Um, and so, and actually even back to George O.C. McKay, we talked about them as being Aboriginal people, we did talk about that as being colonized. And that was you know, the end of the, the chain period there. So anyway, my first encounters with the Presbyterian Church were, um, and the indigenous communities were in 2002. And so this is actually before I started doing indigenous research in, in Taiwan. And I think you can see the photo here, the one on the right, you can see how long I've been doing this research. It's by just looking how young I was in that picture. Um, but I was invited to go to the Urban Rural Mission at Changrong, the Presbyterian University in Tainan, by uh, Steve Chen from Ottawa. And so it was very much of a, a Canadian project. And uh, uh, so it was there in Taina. And they had us, like, you can see that they're wearing this t-shirt that says, who am I? <laughs> and so they were encouraging us to think about our identities and who we are. And, and uh, so, there's all these look to put us in the separate groups, and I was with the indigenous group. Of course, I think of who I am too. Mm -hmm. um, but for this talk, I think what's important is really looking at the indigenous group that I would say what they were thinking about. And it was run by a professor of sociology from York University. His name is Dr. Ed File. He's also a minister with the United Church of Canada. And uh, so he, he gives a very Marxist lecture about how capitalism has spread around the world and that it's caused a lot of suffering and, uh, and so forth. And, and then Dr. Albert Lim gives his lectures there. And then they gather in small groups and they talk about women's issues and uh, uh, issues of the poor and labor and environmental issues. And there's a small group of indigenous people there. So I joined them. And they talked about their pain being caused by not being allowed to hunt. Because it's, it's, they said that one of them said that hunting is to our culture what the tea ceremony is to Japanese culture. And so brought that up. And then at the end, they were asked to make a map of their ideal Taiwan. And so they're including in the map 
people hunting happily and the animals living happily. And so that's what you see here. So that was my one of my first encounters with the URM and the Presbyterian Church. And I felt very comfortable with the Presbyterian Church because they uh, tend to be one of those social justice churches. Uh, the uh, Yushan Seminary in Guangdong actually came out in support of same-sex marriage, for example. And they've been kind of on the progressive part of Christianity. And so I've, I felt comfortable with them. And actually one of the first field sites that I have, and I, even when I was teaching at Dongma University from 1999 to 2001, I had visited this church, met with Pastor Gao, and talked to him about issues about indigenous people there. And this Jiwan Presbyterian Church was founded in the Japanese period by a Doruka woman. Her name was Jiwan, and she had come back from Taipei, and she brought with her these teachings, and they met in a cave, you can visit the cave, uh, because the Japanese were discouraging people from converting to Christianity. And so the Jiwan Presbyterian Church has been very important in the name rectification created the Taroko tribe. They became a tribe in 2004. So on the right hand side, right next to the cross, you can see it says Rintong, identity. So identity is a big issue. And of course, George Leslie Mackay was an important person in the history of the church. So when I tell people I come from Canada, they're all quite enthusiastic about meeting me and talking to me about the church and so forth. And un un unknown to me at the time was, and I found this out after my, my, uh, my, my aunt died, and she left the Bibles that my grandmother had left behind, and there were all these Bibles, and one of them I opened up and a piece of paper fell out, and it was about an activity that their church had held to raise funds for George Leslie Mackay's activities in Taiwan. And so what I didn't realize is that my grandmother, before she got married and became Anglican, she had been Presbyterian, and that her parents had been involved in raising funds for the missions in Taiwan. And he even mentioned that they're the headhunters of Taiwan. <laughs> so it was quite interesting to, to discover that Somehow, my great grandparents had been involved in creating this church that created the indigeneity that I'm studying in Taiwan. So, so it all kind of comes together in a certain way, in a very personal way, um, and that created a kind of indigeneity that I've been studying to this day. But Christianity has been added to a religion that was already there. Like I mentioned, the, the rainbow before. The Sejek and Dorugu people actually had a very rich cosmology and a very rich religious tradition before Christianity came. That's part of a way of looking at the world that includes many stories about animals and relations between humans and others. One of them that I think is particularly important is the origin story of humanity, which happened in Nanto at this rock. And the story is that at the very beginning of time, there was the rock opened up and three people emerged from the rock. There were two men and one woman. And as they came out of the rock, they looked around at the world. And one of the men looked at the world and he saw all of these animals and plants and thought this is a really wonderful place because there's just so much life and we can hunt and we can eat and uh, there's such green plants and so forth. And another man looked at it and he thought this is a really horrible place because there's so much death here. And it's just such a horrible thing. One has to kill one another to eat. And so he turned back and went back inside the rock. <laughs> and then there was a jumble there, kind of an earthquake, and the rock closed up, and he was stuck inside forever. And then the, the first man and the first woman came out. And 
became the ancestors of all humanities. Pastor Juan Giro says that was Adam and Eve, so Nanto is the Garden of Eden. So, but there have been a number of other religious specialists around. There were the Masaba, who are kind of the medicine women. And they've pretty much disappeared. I uh, was able to meet two of them in my five years of, in the, in the first years when I was on my research there. And the, one of them that I met in one room, she passed away. And uh, I got some good interviews with her. And another one in, in Tongda, she's still around. She does quite a bit of rituals uh, with they have students coming or somebody who wants to learn about traditional life and she does a ritual. But very rarely would it actually an indigenous person consult her. And there are stories about witches, the honey. Uh, somebody told me a story quite recently about when they were young, there was a woman in their village who had a bird in her cage and the bird that she could use to make people sick by somehow by sending it out. And then there's the bird divination that I talked about yesterday. Um, the idea that bird behavior and their voices can tell you if you're going to be successful or not at hunting. There were also rituals related to agriculture and health. And of course there were rituals of head hunting. So that was a very important part of their religion. Uh, Fernando Kyoto, who also translated Durkheim into Japanese, did really pioneering work on religion and ritual in Taiwan. He's got a, a book about that. But what we can see is there's a very rich traditional cosmology uh, among the Dugu people. Uh, there's the Rainbow Bridge, the Haga Uduk that I just talked about. Um, there's the idea of the non of the people in Hwani, and somehow Nanto is a very special spiritual place where the ancestors came from. Uh, there are lots of stories about that. There's different taboos that they have. There was a lot of things that they thought about the behavior of uh, animals, such as uh, uh, dogs and so forth, and pigs. And so what would you have to do to restore Gaia if, uh, you know, for example, if a dog were to bite a corpse, or if pigs were to copulate in that house, and things like that. So. And then there was the importance of the community, or the Allah. So there was a very rich cosmology before the colonial period. We just talked about Poland and Gaia. Um, the uh, big killings is the ritual where the ancestors are talked about. And the, the true, true Jesus church people don't do that part of the ritual. They, in some places they kill the pigs and share the meat. And in Nanto I found that they don't even kill the pigs themselves. They hire from a professional abattoir. And then they can avoid all the so I have this picture of the dogs here, with the, it's one of the hunters was raising the dogs and the equipment. So, in my chapter I talked about my own personal experiences with some of these things, and I've talked about that, and so has before, I think that um, I'm going to go with that. But I think that what is often ignored is that the presence of Shintoism, um, which I don't think anybody's ever studied, and most uh, Indigenous people don't talk about that too much, but there was the Japanese encouraged them very strongly to participate in Shinto rituals. And so that kind of, I think, explains a lot of the uh, way in which they looked at the Kami Sama of the forest. Uh, I think that's, that's part of that. Uh, one of the medicine women told me about a Shinto shrine that had been taken down by the Republic of China government. She said that they used to go there and they would ring this bell and clap their hands and bow. And if they rang the bell and then it rang again by itself, and that would be a sign that your prayer would be answered. And if it didn't, then it wouldn't be answered. And she said that they tore it down. And she said after they tore down the shrine, they tried to make it an agricultural land. But nothing ever grew there. I was stayed barren. And she said the Japanese left with their spirit stayed behind. So the, I think there's some trace of, of Shintoism is there. They refer to the ancestors, but also to ghosts in general as Uduk. And there's 
quite a lot of fear of the Udur. Uh, so quite a lot of fear of passing by cemeteries and so forth. So, and there are stories about their conversions, and I think those are probably some of the most important parts, is to look at how people have converted. Um, one of the people, for example, that I talked to from the True Jesus Church uh, said that when the churches first came into the community, these people really resisted them. And he said they eventually recognized that the church was bringing to them something that was the same guide that they already had. The difference was that the rules are written down in a book rather than in their own hearts. And he said to me that, he said, and I quote here, Christianity helped us answer the one and only question unanswered by our old religion. He said, the question was, what is the name of God? So they didn't have that in their old religion. He said, the answer is Jesus. Uh, he also gave me another name of Jesus, which is Udokutumina, which is the God that wove the world together. Um, so he basically said that it was a, a continuation of Gaia. And also had Presbyterians tell me that. The, the Gaia before told them that they had to be generous with one another, they had to take care of their family and community, and they had to be fidel, loyal in their marriages. And that's what Christianity tells them as well. There was another woman I talked about who was in her 80s, and she was saying that the old Gaia was terrible because it was all about headhunting. And uh, so she said that nowadays some people still make sacrifices before hunting and sacrifices of rice, wine, tobacco, and so forth. And they really shouldn't do that. Um, another woman said there's only one God and you should not pray twice. So the idea of syncretism is something that some people don't accept. There was another woman who gave me a story about her grandmother who was a very powerful medicine woman. And her uh, grandfather was a great headhunter with the skull racks in front of his house, so they were very big in the traditional religion. Her son-in-law said to me, sometimes the heads would cry or they would turn their heads. And so she said that they uh, discovered, that her grandmother discovered that Jesus had a magic even greater than her own. And so she converted. And she says that she suffered herself because of the sins of her grandparents. And that's why she's had a, a son who's slightly retarded and a daughter who's been in the nursing home all of her life because of the condition she was born with. And she says that the next generation will do well because they've converted to Christianity. Uh, then there are issues about how to translate the word for God. Um, as it's in the Uda Baro, which is the God and evident. The true Jesus Church reject calling it that at all because they don't want that word Udo, which is a, a word for spirits and ghosts in their language. So they, ironically, they use the word Kamisama, which is Japanese. So, coming back to the phenomenology of religion, I, I think it's important to look at the materiality of churches and so how there's a difference in the places where people worship. Uh, ritual no longer happens in the forest. It's not something that happens in the open and this vegetarian among the vegetation. Verano had called their old rituals invisible churches because it was they would have rituals outside in the gardens or in the forest. Nowadays it's in concrete buildings, so it's imposing pieces of architecture that draw their attention forward towards the altar and then upwards. The Protestant churches are very austere, and for the Durbo and Sejik, those are the really churches. Um, so we have here a photograph of the uh, Presbyterian church on the top. I love the, the dog that kind of meanders in and out of the services. And then the True Jesus Church on the bottom here. The True Jesus Church, they speak in tongues. Uh, so they got their practices of glossolalia. Um, and then the, because of the architecture, you just the sounds reverberate and it just seems to, you can't really tell where the sounds are coming from. And it really does give you a sense that the Holy Spirit has just filled up the room. I think there's a, a real part of that is the, the physicality of it. There are some of those cognitive approaches I'm going to go that are a bit attractive. But I'm going to come back to Marx here. 
religion is always social. And so there's a, a social aspect in every single one of these churches and their congregations. Uh, for example, uh, in Minlo, which is where the Skadam and Hokos people live down in the, in, the, in, the, in the village, it's always been a question to people, why do they have to have two Presbyterian churches right across the street from one another? In a community with just a few hundred people, it would make more sense to combine them and have one. But the reason is that they came from two different alam in the mountain, and they were moved down, and they keep that up. And so they go to the church that belongs to their own community. They, the only time that they came together was a very short period of time when the minister at one church was married to a woman from the other alam. And so they uh, managed to come together. But after he passed away, then they had two separate pastors again. And they really do prefer to have that separate community and identity. So, we're looking at really the orientation that the church has given in terms of time and space as well. Christianity gives them a sense of belonging to a bigger story of humanity. And in terms of really looking at you know, the, the story of the resurrection and looking forward to the world to come, and all of that is part of that. In terms of space, the Presbyterian Church tends to give them an orientation really vis-a-vis -vis the world. And it gives them connections with Canada and with the West and with indigenous communities. Um, I've been I'm part of that actually because I've taken Duruku people from the Presbyterian Church in Taiwan and visit indigenous communities in Nova Scotia and Hokkaido. And they tend to be involved in, in certain social networks, like we see at the top of the Presbyterians meeting at the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy, including the big proponent of Taropo, name rectification and autonomy. The Catholic Church gives them a connection with their only, the Republic of China's only ally in Europe, the Vatican. The True Jesus Church gives them a relationship with China. It was a church established in China in 1917, if I remember correctly, 1919. But it gives them a relationship with China and with people who came from China after the Second World War. And so it creates another kind of network. I was at one event that at the church service today, you know, Saturday, there was a speaker from China who came this is relatively recently, and gave a lecture about how China is now opening up and has more religious freedom than ever. And he welcomes them to come and learn about that because the True Jesus Church is that within the self patriotic Church of China is very active. And they share their churches with others who use it on Sunday and use it on Saturday, and he encourages them to come and visit. And then after the service, they always meet together and eat. And that was quite inconvenience, I thought, because they put the special guest right next to me, and there was a pillar on the other side of him. And so I was stuck talking with this man for the entire meal. And after he left, I think somebody said, did you notice the seating arrangement? And she said, it's because none of us wanted to talk to him. <laughs> so the church was trying to do something politically, and there was resistance to that. And I've seen that among Presbyterians, too. This church often brings in this DPP message, and then there's resistance in the community. So there's something that happens everywhere. And I think that's what's happening. I'm not going to, I talked about, you know, about, about Mish, Meshburg yesterday, but I think networks are the important thing when it comes to the churches. They're creating networks. So it's a real big part of uh, what they're needing. So, I think that no matter what religion may be, it may be many of those things that we just talked about. It is, it is social. Uh, maybe it is a way of reducing pain. I think that most of all, the, the church is what's important to them. So they have all of these activities in the church, and that makes, it, it provides a number of things for people. Uh, one thing it does is it creates a strong continuity with the identity of the Allah. 
So there's a real big overlap between church congregations and then the small hamlets that they lived in in the, in the mountains. They came down and they kind of keep that community alive somehow. They've created a space in which they have rituals. And the meals are probably more important than the rituals. And singing together and praying together, just being together and being there for one another when there's a wedding or a funeral or a baptism or whatever. There's that sense of being together which is important for them. It's important to note that the conversion happened only after the Sejek and Drugu and other indigenous people, of course, were evicted from their forests. So they're uh, no longer able to live as they did. And in fact, most of them actually don't spend much time in the forest anyway. I noticed that the hunters that I really like spending time with are the ones who are more syncretic with their practices. Uh, quite often when they're in the village, they will be Christian. But then when they go into the mountains, they'll make sacrifices to the ancestors and, and talk about the spirits of the mountain and so forth. Um, I think the conversion happened only after they needed foreign or Chinese allies as well. So it's part of the story. It doesn't explain everything. But it's part of the attraction. You know, they can have relations with churches that are organizations that go beyond. And it's been very useful for them as they've created the indigenous social movement. Uh, the URM is one of the arenas in which they actually came up with the term Yunzu, so which then they lobbied to put into the constitution and it became the basic law on indigenous peoples. And it came out and emerged from activities of the Presbyterian Church. Uh, of course, the, the True Jesus Church has its allies with Chinese, especially with the KMT, but also with the Chinese Communist Party. These activities also make people happy. I think we have to just admit that the people are getting some pleasure from all of this. It may not make a lot of sense to people who aren't in, in the churches and going to the church, and, but they seem to really enjoy the, the singing. There's a joyfulness to it, which people find meaningful. The True Jesus Church, they speak in tongues at the beginning, about 10 minutes of their service, and at the conclusion. And they, they say that that's a, the Holy Spirit that fills them. And they find that to be very meaningful. So it's not really a question of belief, I think, but it's of doing things that make people find meaning and feeling happy. But I think we should not overlook those who don't attend church either. And I think that, you know, there's a certain bias built into studying Christianity by going to churches. Um, I did have a few experiences with people who told me quite openly that they were not interested in that at all. There was, I remember a time when I was crossing the street to go to the Jiwan Presbyterian Church with my hymn book and my Bible in my hand, and somebody said to me, don't waste your time with that. <laughs> He said, just sit down and have a beer with me instead and not waste your time on other things at church. When I walked around doing a, at the very beginning of my research there, in, in two villages I was asked by the local people to do a survey and kind of figure out opinions about different things. And I asked my own questions and the people asked their own questions. And one of the questions was their religion. And there were, most people, Rather, about 90% of the people identified with a, one of the churches there. But then there were others who said, well, <laughs> so if I'm not interested, in where I put down. So there really was, there's, there are some people in the villages who really don't care about religion at all. And I think it's important to understand that as well. And then last but not least, these churches all did their best to try to make me feel at home. And so that's, in spite of the fact that I began with the Presbyterian Church, the other churches finally reached out and did their best to make me feel at home. There was absolutely no pressure to convert to anything or speak in tongues. But here are the people of the True Jesus Church, who, in, up in Nantong, who really tried to make me feel at home and you know, had a 
bar, which you informed me on my last day, and really welcome you every time I go back. And so that's a part of it, I think, is just making a community. And most people don't care about the doctrines or talk about that at all. It's just a question of being together and sharing meals and tea and so forth. The True Jesus Church, uh, they encourage people not to drink alcohol. And they, I think that creates a different sense of community as well. And so that's a big part of it. So I, I was thankful for that, that people were so kind as I was doing the research. So anyway, I want acknowledgments to everybody. And thank you all for being here tonight. And I've stayed in the time limit, and now we can move on to discussion. So thank you all. You don't have um, mics here. Are you okay? Yeah, yeah. not too jet lag. No? Yeah, I'm trying to. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, that was um, uh, fantastic. And again, once again, um, uh, loads of questions um, in, in my mind. The, the, the first one that kind of crossed my mind was um, how representative are the city kind of through? Mm -hmm. um, are these kind of uh, conversion patterns? Um, repeated in, in most of the other um, nations within, within Taiwan, uh, or, or are they exceptional? I mean, are there, for example, um, groups that completely rejected Christianity? Okay, there are no groups that completely rejected right. okay. Christianity. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I think the biggest difference is that the Roman Catholic Church has been more successful in the South, okay. mm -hmm. and the Protestant Church has been more successful in the North. And some people think that that has to do with their traditional social structure. Mm -hmm. The Paiwan and the Bukai people had more of a hierarchical social structure with a nobility and common people. So they're much more comfortable with the church that comes in hierarchy. And the Presbyterians and the True Jesus Church are very egalitarian in their ethos. Mm -hmm. And so each congregation is very independent. And um, the, the Presbyterian Church, they have their elders, but they say that's like the Council of Luton, the elders that they had before, mm -hmm. where everybody who is attained of maturity as an adult male, tradition of adult male, female mm -hmm. together, has a certain kind of prestige and way of talking. And the elders together will collectively discern what happens in the church. So there's a kind of egalitarianism in Stress. And then the true Jesus Church is even more egalitarian because they'll say, we don't even have pastors. Mm -hmm. So what they have is they've got somebody from within the congregation who will take over the role of preparing a sermon and so forth. But they don't have pastors. And then is the relationship between the three churches uh -huh. back? Yeah. So, so uh, if someone wanted to marry someone from another church, mm -hmm. would that be resistant? If somebody wanted to marry somebody from the true Jesus Church, that would be resistant. Ah, oh, okay. So Catholic Presbyterian would, yeah. would be a little bit easier, but it still would be a different help. Mm. But the, the problem with the true Jesus Church and intermarriage would be the nice mm. thing they on a Saturday, they don't drink, they have different rules about dealing with blood mm. uh, that's important for hunters. So, for example, they, they can't, they have to drain the blood. So they can't take an animal that's been trapped and already died. So okay. they have to inspect their traps more regularly. Mm. And in terms of the um, uh, conversion timing, you mentioned the key moment was when um, the groups moved uh, downward from the forest. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so here we're talking um, at some point in the in the Japanese yeah. um, uh, era, but but. Um, at least from what I understood from discussions with, with Nikki, um, the Japanese were put a lot of pressure on uh, Christian churches. Um, so, uh, how were they actually able to operate um, and operate seemingly very effectively in terms of their missionary work yeah. in the colonial era? Yeah. Did that come up in discussions with elders? Yeah, the, the, especially in, in Fushinton, where the Presbyterian church was found in the 30s. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the True Jesus Church there was probably in the 30s. Okay. And so, mm -hmm. Jiwang had to have their church services in a cave. Okay. And 
up in Scotland, the church was established at the end of the Japanese period too. So they were all talking about how they would have to have their meetings in secret. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the true Jesus Church had an interesting story. It was uh, actually one of the persons I worked most closely with. His father started the church, mm -hmm. and there is a story that he likes to tell about how his another man in the village who was the head of the uh, the youth court that the Japanese asked him to make denounced him to the police and for for being a missionary, mm -hmm. and so they arrested <coughs> him and they put him in a bamboo detention said that he created a hut there mm -hmm. and locked it up. And then overnight there was a typhoon <laughs> that blew the bamboo apart and so he was able to escape. And so they like to, you know, to tell that story about his father. Um, the person who denounced him after the war became a Presbyterian minister himself. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, there's, a, there's a lot of discussion in the Presbyterian church there about what that means. So, okay, let's move to some uh, questions here, Mike. Um, I'm really curious as to whether the Christians managed to instill the idea of sin and the appearance of sin and possibly the fact that they're out of Did they manage to transmit that sin? That's possibly a vision of sin. Yeah. I don't believe that they actually got the idea of original sin. I've never heard anybody talk about original sin before. I've only heard people talk about Gaia. So I think that what's happened is that the church has come in and there was this old thought that was already there, and they didn't really replace that with anything. So that's why we talk about Christianity, because for them it's the Gaia. It's not about being born with sin. It's about what you do in your life today. And so that's... The, the theology is something they're very weak on. They don't really think too much about it. There's any ritual forgiveness of sin. Oh no. <laughs> There's the idea I think that if you do sin in a certain way, if you do something that violates Gaia, then something will happen to you. So you might fall down in the mountains. It's still there. So it hasn't really been replaced with the Christian theology that we know in the West. Oh yeah, okay, you got I was interested in um, the connection between dispossession and uh, Presbyterianism. Uh, the established church in Scotland is Presbyterian, of course, and has been for uh, much, much too long. Um, and has done a lot of, in my view, and many other people's view, a lot of cultural damage. Now, during the, um, the, the um, 18th century, when the higher currencies took part, which is where the landowners found they could make a bigger profit from sheep on the land. And, and, and people who were thousands of years on, on the land and held in common were forced to the, to the coast and shipped out to Maine and Canada, Nova Scotia in particular, and, and other places. The Presbyterian Church supported the land of us. Okay? It was God's will, not all. But there was a schism, and so we had a free Presbyterian Church, which <coughs> supported. Uh, dispossessed people, and so many of them embraced this uh, this this new church, which unfortunately had an even more um, uh, rigorous uh, doctrine and practice. And even to this day, uh, members of the free church, the free church, do not even celebrate uh, Christmas. It's quite joyous. Okay. And uh, the other thing I want to ask you is this: um, Presbyterian ministers in the nineteenth century, I mentioned this yesterday. I used to go out to, in, in, into the countryside in the area of Scotland with sledgehammers and smash up prehistoric, a beautifully carved prehistoric stones that contain not just the artwork but the remnants of the British language, language and inscriptions. And I think this is the same thing as the Taliban destroying the giant buildings in Afghanistan. Also, to illustrate some of this last uh, point, um, there's, a, there's a contemporary film group that's Tushar Valley's um, called Blazing. Fiddles, blazing, sorry, blazing fiddles. Now, the blazing does not refer to their um, high-speed uh, playing skills. It refers to the fact that during times of Presbyterian or Protestant religious revival, there were bonfires of fiddles. Fiddles voluntarily submitted the edition because it's a devil's music. And this happened not just in Scotland, but in Northern, 
to bring them at times of religious revival. So my question has um, the introduction of Protestant religion noticeably affected traditional culture, and if it has, are the people aware of it? But this is something that question. What is the degree of tolerance for non-believers? Okay, uh, the big question. Is Sorry, very important, but but I think uh, one of the like when I was at my work on the birds. But there were people who didn't really want to talk about the birds because they said it's a sin. Mm. And that was in both the true Jesus Church and in the Presbyterian Church when people would bring this up. But it was the Presbyterian Church is split in a way because there are those who are big on the indigenous social movement. They're looking for new symbols of indigeneity. For them, it's attractive to use the Shishilas as a symbol. And for them, that's important. Others in the Presbyterian Church are really against anything that has to do with their own culture. So there are divisions within the church. Uh, sometimes this comes up, for example, some people have created these cultural renaissance NGOs, and they apply for funding from the government to have so-called traditional rituals, which have nothing to do with real traditional rituals, but they'll do, for example, they'll do a headhunting ritual in which they'll use a doll as a surrogate for a human being and they cut off the head and do the ritual for a, an audience of mostly tourists. And so the one set of Presbyterians is very active in this and say, well, we're recreating our, our, our traditions. And then other Presbyterians say, it's a sin to do all of this. And so there are all kinds of things that are going on. With the Masambo, for example, both the Presbyterians and the True Jesus are afraid of his medicine movement. So both of the medicine movement that I encounter from Roman Catholics, because the Roman Catholic is much more open mm. to the syncretism. Uh -huh. yeah. And so there are there are things going on with the Presby the Protestants of both have been harsher. And then of the two, the true Jesus Church is the one that is harshest on traditional culture. So they really don't want people to participate in these big sacrifices. They don't mind them sharing meat with one another, but they don't want to have words spoken to the ancestors and pieces of meat attached to the trees and so forth. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. It's another great Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Today you Yeah. Well, I think that the 
this uh, localization happened is because, you know, when people first converted, they had no idea what they were doing, is it? Because <laughs> they didn't have degrees. How would they convert if you don't know what you're doing? They didn't know. They didn't have degrees in theology. They, they just knew that somebody was coming. And some of them say, well, we converted at first because we wanted food from the missionary. So these would be the conversions after World War II. But I think that's a bit too simplistic as well. But some people said that we converted because we wanted the food and the clothing that they provided. It was after the war. We needed it back then. But that's something. But they, it, it really takes a long time before people start to learn that doctrine is all about mm -hmm. faith and reading the Bible. And so I think it took over a generation. The first, the first generation of converts had never read the Bible. So they had no idea what this was all about. So I think it really had to do with creating a new sense of home at a time of really intense social change and finding a way in which they can reach out to allies elsewhere and meet other people who can help them with their projects. And generally the True Jesus Church has been much more of a KFT church and I think it's a part of creating a good relationship with mainlanders, with Chinese people who were coming to Taiwan. And... No, 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 this is the 1950s. Oh, yes, right. okay. So, and the church started in the 1930s, when the KFT came, but it is the Chinese church. It was founded in Beijing, and the idea was that the the founders of that church, that we don't need foreign missionaries, we can interpret the Bible on our own, and they, they do it in a very different way. Uh, they're very fundamentalist, they, they don't celebrate Christmas and Easter because that's not in the Bible. They, they have their Sabbath on Saturday, they say that that's what the Bible says. They, nowadays they like to, actually, some of them actually look to what, what happens in Jewish communities, because they see them as being really part of that tradition too. Yeah, so. Um, so I'm still interested in the point that you mentioned yesterday and also today. The network replaced the yeah. March work. Mm -hmm. So network is one word, but March work still haven't find it. Yeah. And, and so, um, so this also means um, the Christianity is to create a network mm -hmm. in the church, mm -hmm. right? And so no tradition of preachers, other rainbow mm -hmm. and uh, a communication with the ancestor, um, people that sacrifice mm -hmm. is kind of more associated with the mesh work. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is my question. Yeah, yeah. So the network yesterday you met, Interconnected point uh -huh. and then magic work is the in the weaving uh -huh. the lines. Right? So so this is me um, it's a two different uh, types of community, mm -hmm. different types of the uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. So um, the how uh, but this also not a really uh, the the tradition which are not really
I think the mood was very conservative. Right, okay. Yeah. So I think that the <coughs> theological seminary made their public statement, but almost everybody I knew was very conservative. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they knew about God. <laughs> <laughs> so, but they, they, uh, they knew the kind of. Did that apply across the, the three churches? Well, you know, the, like the Presbyterian Church that I worked with most intimately mm. in Hualien, they organized a bus trip to Taipei to protest against same-sex marriage. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so that really made me angry at them for a, for quite a while. Yes. <laughs> because the same group of people has never participated in a protest for indigenous rights. Okay. Mm -hmm. But they'll go and protest against somebody else's rights and not even support their own rights. And because so, um, <laughs> one of the things that, that's, uh, that's, that's coming out of some of the, one of Michael Cole's talks yeah. uh, was the influence of um, American churches yeah. on um, uh, some of these um, kind of pushing Taiwanese churches in a more conservative yeah, direction. Yeah. Um, to what extent does that kind of tally with what you've observed? Actually, you're in the field. I haven't seen any Americans in the field. Ah, oh, okay. So, mm -hmm. so, you know, Michael is, you know, in more urban settings. Yes. Mm -hmm. in there, but I haven't really seen them. Right, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, it's, something, so it's, it's a decision that's been made, um, uh, in, actually, in on the spot. Right. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah. Of course, I, I want to come following up now. Actually, following the discussion. Um, the photograph you showed us of the church, uh -huh. they had a big cross on top. Uh, was it a neon cross? Neon cross, yeah. Mm. Yes, so like the Protestant churches are in South Korea, mm -hmm. so you look, look at a, a village or a town, there's only one Christian, but uh -huh. on top of their dwelling, they have a, a neon um, a cross that everybody has to look at. I think they're quite common. Yeah. Mm. yeah. <laughs> I was wondering, Juliet, um, to what extent did uh, Scott's observations kind of overlap with your own observations? Because you, 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 you've been in similar, same village, is that right? Yeah. No. No, a different. No. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah. I was surprised. Have you seen any of the indigenous people that so these churches? You know, I have not. Mm. Mm. But I should say I have not. I have not met any Duru or Sejik people who told me that it's a, it's a, it has anything to do with I have one Lukai friend. Mm. And she said to me, I think it's a tragedy that all up and down the East Coast, there are all these churches that represent a foreign religion, and everybody just blindly follows this foreign religion. Uh -huh. oh, who tried to convert me and But 
after a while, I did start feeling comfortable with them because they were just as friendly as everybody else. And I think it's better for my health to spend time with them because they don't, ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. because they don't give me as much alcohol. They give me zero alcohol. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Presbyterians like to try to get me drunk, and I think that is worse for my health. So, yeah. And is there any attempt to kind of, um, would there be a problem if someone was trying to convert, um, let's say someone, um, a Presbyterian was trying to convert true Jesus? I've never heard of that. Have okay. So that can't be that. Um, but even though they're in the same village. Yeah, they're in the same village because they okay. typically say, well, that's their Allah. Mm -hmm. But it's really seen almost as a geographical thing. It's like the village I've been working in, they perceive themselves as one of five different Allah. And Kala is the true Jesus one. Okay. <coughs> and then the other four are divided among three Presbyterian churches and a Roman Catholic church. And I think they've got their territories pretty much staked out since decades ago. Okay. So and basically it's going clear. back to kind of colonial, yeah, yeah. Japanese colonial. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it's clear that Kala is true Jesus church. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. And there are those who have left the church, including the guy whose father founded the church. Mm -hmm. And people are not too tolerant about those people. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, pray. Um, <clears throat> just some strange things that are happening. Kind of uh, the youngsters, do they have a choice uh, of, of be converted or not? Or is, this, is it almost like since everybody do it, you must do it? Question. Second, um, like nowadays generations, lots of youngsters they are a lot more educated or they consume more information globally. Uh, what happened to this problematic one who grow up? from this kind of traditional and religious background and exposed to sort of like a like metropolitan kind of <coughs> international world and uh, being uh, like accepted different sexuality. Uh -huh. like how, where do they find that ground in their kind of tribes of the society? Yeah. In, this, in the community? I think that because it's been there for so long that almost everybody starts out as a child growing up in the church. And if you actually go to the church, you'll see that the really dynamic part of the church are the teenagers. Mm -hmm. So it really, that's almost like a teenage thing, all the, the singing and the dancing and the drums and everything. It tends to be the teenagers who really think about that. Then they go to university, maybe, and then have different lives and they go to the city. And, you know, it's, it's, yeah, I think that they, they, they do discover these things. And I think it can be difficult for some of them. They feel, I think there's a lot of social pressure to stay in the village. At the same time, I've heard other stories. There was, and again, this is before I started doing my Daruga work, but I, I met a guy in Taipei who, when he got AIDS, went back to his village. And I asked him, but aren't they all Christians? Aren't they very conservative? And he said, well, he feels that that's where people treat him the best, and he's the most accepted there. So, that's just one case. Yeah, uh, Mike, you've got me the last question. Yeah, um, I'm very surprised that you didn't seem to think there were conflicts within Christian societies. I mean, you look Latin America. Every distance would come down and completely split the community yeah. and the Catholics and the Latin Father. There were all sorts of um, um, things, be it about speakers, um, time, and time, and such and such. You don't seem to find that exactly at that Well, I think that when, when I said there were debates about <laughs> the same sex marriage or about the things, you know, the, 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 the women, the medicine women, those are conflicts in the community. And I think that, you know, overall, I think that the cultural damage has been stronger even than, than, than anything else that's going on. And the, the lot of damage has been done in the church. And people will 
often say that, and especially with Confucian, where, where there are five alam in five different church congregations, and it's partly because of the churches that they can't collaborate together mm. and be part of one village community. But that being said, they've never collaborated together as one community, even before the churches came in, because before they were scattered in the mountains. So I don't think we can really blame the church for creating those divisions. <coughs> but it, it does create other divisions. And within each congregation, there are also conflicts. You know, there, the Jiwang Church, the, the pastors tend to be very pro-independence for Taiwan and for um, the DPP, and then elders of the church and regular members of the congregation will be very critical of that. They don't like to have these political pastors. In the church of Wanrong there, one of the elders said to me, because I mentioned to him that, you know, this, this pastor never says anything about politics. And he said, oh, he would really like to talk about politics. Oh, he, would, he wants very much to talk about the DPP and how he great and some say and so forth is. But we wouldn't let him. We've already made it very clear that if he talks about politics, he's going to lose his job. Ah. And so there are all kinds of conflicts, <coughs> and one of it, some of it's political. And you know what I think? It's the benign influence of Canada, uh -huh. as opposed to the southern United States, and the religious groups incorporated in the laws of Texas. <laughs> um, okay, um, on that note then, I think we should um, uh, thank Scott for two amazing uh, talks. And, uh, and he's kind of hinted that he might be willing to come back um, fairly soon. I mean, um, maybe some school next year will be a next year. Um, um, I think we'd be delighted to kind of welcome him uh, back. And we look forward to seeing uh, how this chapter uh, develops. So let's give Scott another big uh, round of applause.